Romans 10. Last week, we expressly noted the glory of God that was revealed through the power of his wrath, particularly as it was applied to his chosen people called Israel. The sufficiency of his work in and through them was revealed only to a remnant as Isaiah prophesied, emphasizing the horror of the stumbling block called self-righteousness that was crafted out of legalism. Did you capture that sentence? So I'm calling your attention to that sentence. I'll say it again. The sufficiency of his work, God's work, in and through them, that is Israel, was revealed only to a remnant, as Isaiah had prophesied, emphasizing the horror of the stumbling block called self-righteousness that was crafted out of legalism. Okay? Good morning. Good morning. Paul could and did testify to that sin, which claims salvation without a faith in God's Messiah, a zealous behavior notwithstanding. If you look at verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. <laughs> Knowing about God's righteousness did not subject them to it, as they revised it and made themselves a wicked and religious people. You take the truth and revise it, you become very wicked. Just as the psalmist uh, stated in Psalm 50 that we have read twice, now Paul refers to them as devious agnostics. If you look at the word in, chapter, in verse 2, knowledge is epigenosis, but if you take a look at the word knowing, it is the word that we get our word agnostic from. So, I would say to you, Paul refers to them as devious agnostics. Establishing their own righteousness, it says in verse 3. That's a devious agnostic that establishes his own righteousness. This they did by adding to and simultaneously corrupting God's law as their goal of being righteous while deleting Christ's righteousness, who was the true end of all righteousness, it says. They cast him aside. They cast Messiah aside. They didn't need Messiah. God's plan that we read about in Romans 8 makes that clear as obligatory to God's salvation of man that you read in verse 5. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. Greater Israel's lawless practices were only blameless in peer review. Only among themselves did they deem themselves righteous. They ask each other their opinion. We have to be careful in our Sunday school classes that we don't ask for your opinions. Opinions don't count for much, and it doesn't account for God's righteousness. So in peer review, they were satisfied, but they were not satisfied before God's court. Paul defined that failing to be a heart issue. If you look at verses 6 and 8, from last week, it talks about the heart. It's a heart issue. That was first defined in Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema. And we also found it uh, as a mantra still among the Hebrews. 
Uh, they still practice it, that saying to this day, but without any inward commitment. And we found that that was stated in Deuteronomy 30, uh, that commitment to the coming Messiah. They were denying messianic salvation made possible by God's prerogative to send his Christ. And if you take a look at these verses, verses six and seven, they talk about the bringing down of Christ from heaven and the bringing up of Christ from Sheol. That isn't so. Man did not have that power, but they were acting as if they did. It's our right to bring him down. No, it was his prerogative to come down. And so as you read those two verses, who will descend into the abyss? Well, start at verse 6. But that, that righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart, that's your seat of commitment, your seat of reflection. Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. So, they were not empowered to bring him down, verse 6 says, nor did they see any rational need for a resurrected Messiah, verse 7. Their contrived salvation rested in Abraham and the law and their revision of the law. In fact, their revision became more important than the law. Indeed, a true faith makes possible a right response to the preaching of the gospel, it says in verse 8, by believing it. True belief is a heart issue that believes in a resurrected Christ. He is then enabled to confess the gospel according to Christ as eternally secured for man's salvation. With it comes imputed righteousness, verse 10. That removes fear from the saved and fulfills God's promise to us that he will make us his witness before the unsaved world. No choice there. The saved will be my witness, he said. Never to be put to shame, says in verse 11, in doing so, by means of the confession, you will never be put to shame. Now you've noticed how I've reordered a lot of the thought processes. I hope I have not distorted them. We also see in verse 11 and 12, any dismissal of racial discrimination in the universal invitation, as it says in verse 11, to whoever believes. That forcibly contradicted the age-old thought and practice of national Israel. We talked about last week, Jonah's time, in which that prejudice was evidence to deny any Gentile salvation, and particularly in Nineveh largest city apparently on earth at that time, Gentile only. What did Jonah do? Turned his face 180 degrees, did he not? But in the time of Christ, down, down the ladder of 500 years, half a millennium, in Jesus' day, their activity was overt and calling Gentiles dogs. They still carried their prejudice. And in that exclamation, their heart excluded them from the temple worship and from Jewish privilege. Gentiles were cast aside. But Moses said to them, way back then, this righteousness that I demand of you is to take the word of my Messiah to the whole world. We don't need Messiah, they said. We're saved. We're Abraham's children. And look at our righteousness. We've even added to it. Now what do you think God thinks of that? I think that the whole Romans is saying, 
He doesn't like it. It's a cursed. Paul made it clear also, if you look at verse 9, that our confession must name Jesus as Lord, which supersedes our confession of Jesus as Savior. How do I know that? I ask you the question. You remember? How many times is Lord used in the New Testament? 700 times. How many times is Savior used? 10. We close the thought, how often do we neglect to call him Lord? If you look at verses 10 and uh, chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, where we start today, we'll expand on that thought because the scriptures do that. So as we look at verses 12 and 13, they read this way. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. And then quoting from Joel in verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Indeed, just as there is no distinction between Jew and Greek that we read about in the previous verses, and which is a, a part of the theme of Romans in Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There is no such thing as racial prejudice in God's mind. And if you look back even more thoroughly to Romans 3, verses 20 to 23, you see that played out in a larger context of uh, thought. But that truth becomes a joyful proclamation to all believers that confess they have called upon Jesus as Lord. Paul, in his first letter written to the Galatians, had emphasized that truth, and I'll repeat that one. In Galatians 3, 28 and 29, he said this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Here, emphasis is given to lordship salvation. You may want to dangle on that one, but I think that you can't miss it. To call upon the name of the Lord is to submit to God's covenant name, Yahweh. Thus excluding any other name as master or Lord. As you looked at Joel's quote here in verse 13, it became an idiom as a frequently rehearsed exclamation in the Old Testament. If you don't believe me, let's turn back to Psalm 19 and see how that fits. In Psalm 19, if you start with verse 7 and go through verse 9, take a look at Yahweh. The law of the Lord is perfect for restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right and rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They're all righteous altogether. How many times do you have to say Lord before you capture who Lord is? Though we frequently say Jesus is our Savior, 
Remember that Savior is only used 10 times in the New Testament. Lord is used 700. How often do we neglect to call him Lord? Let's look at forces 14 and 15. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. Scripture implores man to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That is the voice of Joel in verse 13 that Paul repeats. But how can that occur in its proper order? And so verses 14 and 15 give us proper order of how God made it possible to call him Lord. They must first be made conscious of who he is as to truly believe he is who he claims to be. That cannot occur without hearing it from a preacher, it says in verse 14. Preacher in the Greek meaning one commissioned to announce him, and in this case as the Messiah. That preacher must be sent, it says in verse 15. From God in order to ignite that faith. The faith that's given to the unbelieving to believe it. It's a gift of God, Ephesians 2. This process brings glad, glad tidings, verse 15 says, uh, of all good things from the mouth of all of God's servants who have been saved. It is a message of marvelous comfort to a once guilty sinner who is immersed formerly in fear of condemnation by a holy God and now is relieved from it. So as we look at verse 16 and 17, we have to ask the question, so where lies human accountability? If you look at verse 16, it reads, however, they did not all heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah had been the one who had claimed only a remnant of Israel would be saved. Not all Israel is Israel, he said. And we have counted all Israel as the sand of the sea. But we're not talking about the remnant being the sand of the sea. There are not that many saved. How many are saved today? How many professing Christians are there out there that are not believing Christians? There's a lot of them. And so you see the evolution of cultism even within the Protestant Catholic Church. So the question comes up in verse 16. They did not all heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Not would everyone heed this gospel. Let's look at Isaiah 53, 1. Um, a familiar verse to you. It reads this way. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I mean, this, if you look at the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. How does the Jew treat that chapter today? Totally ignore it. Zvi Kalashir, now dead, marvelous Christian convert, Jewish man, was always in the face of the Haredi, saying to them, you have forsaken Isaiah 53. And they'd scratch their head. Well, we never have looked at that. Peer review. 
says there are certain passages of the Old Testament that don't apply to us. And this is the big chapter. So, there's the picture of Isaiah 53.1 that spoke to the Jewish dilemma of unbelief, did it not? I mean, the whole chapter opens with that thought. Have you looked at John 3.18? He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so we have moved from the day of Isaiah to the day that John wrote this under inspiration to say to the Gentiles as well as he had said to the Jew in Isaiah's day, who has believed? Not very many. This Jewish dilemma of unbelief in Isaiah 53, 1, also rehearsed again in John 3, 18, to the predetermined consequence God has imposed on unbelief to both Jew and Gentile. Unmerited grace demands man's positive response. Does it not? It demands it. It demands a positive response. We might say man has been coerced by God to believe his gospel. Is that not true? So why does he push God away? Look at verse 17, it continues. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You've heard these words over and over and over again. A saving faith is awakened by hearing the word literally concerning Christ. So powerful it be that the Holy Spirit uses it to bring conviction of sin unto repentance and henceforth unto saving faith. Such cannot be prejudiced by vain imagination. But man loves his vain imagination. What is evolution? <clears throat> this vain imagination. It does not come out of the scriptures. So where did it come from? That's just one example. It is the call of God, not the search of man, <coughs> to find him. Jesus made that very clear, didn't he? In John 6, 44, and you might look at verse 45 that follows. As we turn to verse 18, <coughs> But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? And how does Paul answer his rhetorical question? He begs it. Yeah, they have. They've heard. David speaking in the past tense. This is past tense verb. Affirm that truth. In Psalm 19. We were there in Psalm 19 a few minutes ago, but we didn't look at the first half of Psalm 19. And as you look at the first half of Psalm 19, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor their words. Their voice is not heard. Their speech line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance is to the end of the earth. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, and it goes on. But 
Paul is asking here, rhetorically. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? And what is his answer? Indeed, they have heard. And he starts quoting, their voice has gone out into the earth and their words to the ends of the world. We call this what? The universal call of God to all mankind. But if you go further down to that which we read about Lord and the repetitiveness of it in the name of Yahweh, you get very close to the special revelation. Even in this psalm, from the general to the special, my understanding of the early part of Romans, which gave us capture to that thought, was the universal call is without excuse. Romans 1.18, you follow. But you move to chapter 2, and you start talking about the special call. And it has a very special appointment to all men. And it starts with what? He has placed eternity in their hearts, says Ecclesiastes, and that eternity placed in their heart is what kind of an understanding about him? A moral understanding. Is that not true? All men have the law of God written in their heart as to what is right and wrong. I mean, you start there. And if man starts with the finish thoughts of chapter 1, that he's without excuse, when he looks at the creation as the 19th chapter of Psalms has explained it here, he must come to the conclusion, <coughs> and only one conclusion, there is God who made this all. And then his question is only one. Who are you? And when man asks that question, God gives his special revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't think he gives the revelation of Jesus Christ to anybody who is in vain imagination and says, I don't need a Messiah. They were zealous. I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God. But they're not mine. It's a powerful lesson as you go this far down. The voice is a witness of God's creation, specifically the heavenly bodies that are recorded here. We refer to this as the universal call. The full gospel was found through Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. God had made it plain that all earth should hear his revelation from his covenant people, Israel. They were to be the preacher. They had missed that command. They would heard it, but they missed it because they said they didn't need it. After all, we're Abraham's children. After all, we've kept the righteousness of the law. Among ourselves, we agree. Therefore, God must agree with us. That's basically what they're saying. So, instead, Israel defaulted in selfish rebellion and rejected the need of Messiah's saving grace, both to self and to others. We're not going to share it with anybody else because we don't believe in it. But God wasn't finished with Israel. And so we find the new covenant in Jeremiah where he speaks to Israel in particular. And he said, I have given to you covenants and I stand as the one who will make sure they come true. And so at this point in time, we turn to Jeremiah 31 and read that familiar verses that we see for Israel's sake. 
will bring them together so that their name can be written on the doors of the new Jerusalem. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which was made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they broke, although I, it, I was husband to them, and declare, it declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. What is that? That's imputed righteousness. They don't have any more time to tinker with it and distort it. I'm going to write it in their heart. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then they shall not teach again any man his neighbor, and they shall not teach again any each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember, and I will remember no more. How does God do that? How did he save us? Was it partly because I was so willing? I don't think so. He touched me when I was young and I was devoted to those who told me things, to obey what they said. That's the reason why young people come to God. They haven't formed the guile that's necessary to sidestep him. Right, buddy? Right. Marvelous thing. These unconditional covenants given to Israel are marvelous. But he gave to the Gentile an unconditional didn't have to go through all that process of the conditional covenant, which they perverted, and which we would have perverted too, and still do, if we give given our choice. Well, he doesn't really mean that. Ah, you better be careful when you say that. For he surely means it. Have you interpreted it right? That's a good or better question. It's not finished with Israel. It says in Jeremiah, it declares he will impose an unconditional new covenant upon them and bring them to saving grace. How does he do that in the light of the revelation of, of John? Chapter 7. Where does he do it? When does he do it? Remember? With the two witnesses standing in the temple for three and a half years preaching to them, and they didn't heed. But when the two witnesses were killed and left there for them to see that they were dead for three and a half days, and then they were resurrected before the eyes of the whole world and ascended to God. What happens to the heart of the Jewish people alive in that moment? They praise the Lord. I think that's the signal historical event to come. That is the final blow that brings Jeremiah 31 into the life of an unbelieving Israelite. 
Because you see, immediately after that, the explosion of Satan against them. As the Antichrist tries to pursue those that God says, get out of here, get to the wilderness. And the Antichrist goes chasing after them. And God stops him. Those that would not flee, the Antichrist persecutes, martyrs. I think that's a picture of Revelation. It's the only story we have that we can relate to that tells me anything about how Jeremiah 31 works. Otherwise, it seems like, if you read it just without context, that God is doing something to a perverse people that they don't want done to them. They don't want it done to them. They don't want Messiah. They don't want Isaiah 53. They don't want that. They don't want to bring anybody up from the dead. They don't need resurrection. They just need the Antichrist out of the way. They just need Rome out of the way in Jesus' day. We want a Messiah that gets rid of them. Rome. We're tired of that's our saving grace to the Messianic kingdom in the eyes of the Jew. Are you with me? So they were making God in their own image. Exactly. Voltaire's statement was so true. Out of the mouth of an agnostic, an agnostic does hear. You have the Bible that says... God made man in his own image. And you say, no, we're going to make God in our image. So, I say, encapsulation to this, as he imposes the unconditional new covenant upon them and bring them to saving grace, it is to be fully imposed by mid-trib with the proclamation of the two witnesses and God's sign, a signature resurrection to them seen by the whole world. Remember his first resurrection was seen by very few. 500 maybe more, no more. If you look at verses 19 and 20, Paul is beginning to conclude this chapter. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? This is almost rhetorical to what he had said before. Yeah, they knew. At the very first, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding will I anger you. How in the world did they perceive that one? You suppose they threw that one aside too? Moses said it. They said they were servants of Moses. And then in verse 20, and Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who sought me not. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Israel showed willful, willful ignorance of their own scriptures, but not because they did not know. Because you can go back to Genesis 12, 3, and Exodus 19, 5, and 6, and others that record these thoughts for their behalf that we just heard from Paul. Paul quoted from Moses, the lawgiver, and Isaiah, the prophet, that this was willful misunderstanding on their part. Willful misunderstanding. It reflects God's foreknowledge of Israel's prideful obsession. Moses affirmed God would take a no people. You remember back in chapter 9 he talked about the no people? You are not my people, the no people. 
Moses affirmed God would take a no people, void of understanding. And the word in there means senseless. Talking about Gentiles in particular. And save them. Romans 11.11, 11, if you just look, may not even have to turn the page. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Thereby inciting the sinful nature of Jewish misunderstanding by the selfish vehicle of jealousy, provoking their anger. That is so because God had saved by setting aside for their cause knowledge of the law in processing their salvation. He has to set aside, as a tutor would do, that they cannot on their own strength practice the righteousness of God without it being imputed unto them and driven by the Holy Spirit as we've studied to be able to practice it. So daring was Isaiah in Isaiah 65, 5.1, he said these things. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. So in my election of them, I became manifest, it says in the scripture, to them without their request. Yes, indeed, I was found by them but not until I sought them. Do you hear that in that verse? And Isaiah is bold to say, I was found by those who sought me not. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. That's profound. That's a Gentile blessing. If the Abrahamic people won't give you the preaching because they refuse to accept the end of righteousness, which is Christ, then I will. And so he chose a believing remnant of Jewish people, 12 in particular, to give us Gentile, the blessing that we see today and call the church. To do what? Not only to save us, which he had promised to do through Moses, but also to save them. Verse 21. We will finish it. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Paul is returning to Isaiah 65 too, finding it as still true in his day. Israel has proven herself a disobedient, a deliberate rejection is what it means in the Greek, and an obstinate, the word anatolego, to speak against or in opposition to yeah, an obstinate people. Indeed, the Jews would purposely refuse the gospel while the Gentiles eagerly accepted it. But God remains long-suffering in his salvation in treaty to Israel. She was too proud to accept his empowering grace. John 1, 11, his own did not receive him. So indeed, Jesus' sorrow over her that is recorded in Matthew 23 
as he sat on the hillside overlooking Jerusalem. How often I wanted to gather your children together. And you would not. That's enough for today. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Lord, precious are you in your holiness. We've seen your glory and your wrath. We've seen your lordship announced and announced and announced. And we've seen a people reject their Messiah. But you haven't rejected them. You made it plain in Hosea that you are a faithful, faithful mother, wife, to a disobedient husband, to a disobedient wife, but you have not divorced her and not cast her away. Father, in this day we can only rejoice at the truth that you have given us, that it explains why we look at the new Jerusalem and see the imprinted names of the tribes of Israel, and at the same time reflect upon the apostles that brought to the Gentiles something they weren't looking for, but you sent through the Jewish remnant to our salvation, while at the same time making the greater Israel jealous and angry in order to save them. Father, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. How marvelous are your ways. We rejoice this day, O oh Lord, in the peace and the assurance that you've given us as we look upon your glory and aspire to it and the promises that come with it. Come soon, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.